Welcome everybody to the PFF College Football Podcast. I am Seth Galina alongside Deontay Lee. Deontay, what's going on? Not much, man. Not much. You know, I will um I will protect the privacy of the people involved, but we were just kind of talking about some things going on with, you know, football in California, particularly where I'm at. So, you know, things are a little all over the place right now, but you know, just rolling with the punches. Uh, we have on the program today, our, I, I'd say maybe our biggest guest of the, of the history of the PFF College Football Podcast, mm-hmm. uh, former head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, Mr. Mike Tice is going to join us a little bit later. I'm um, excited for you guys to hear that interview, um, talking his time. So what a lot of people don't know, and I didn't really know this until very recently, was <laughs> Mike Tice, the um, you know NFL tight end the offensive line coach in the NFL, and then obviously, like I said, head coach of Minnesota Vikings, but all that stuff, he played quarterback at the University of Maryland. So that's kind of what we have him on the podcast to talk about a little bit, and we got to um, talk to him about that stuff and you know, just general offensive line play uh, since he's been around the position for a long time. So that was, uh, that was a treat, and we'll get that to you in a second. But first, um, it's my turn finally. Um, ask me, Deontay, ask me who I am today. I am PFF underscore. PFF underscore what? What are you today? R. Tong Land Dancer. Okay. Okay. This is from the LSU 2019 playbook. But the reason I chose this, and I'll explain the play in a second. So basically, we're going to have to flip it now. So I'm going to take three hours to explain it, and you have to simplify it in 30 seconds. Gotcha. But so the reason I chose this play, our Tong Land Dancer. This is LSU's, uh, I guess it was their three vertical concept. And I think it's something that we've talked about a lot is how teams are getting into this seven man protection. So LSU is going to fake to the running back and then they're going to block. He's going to end up blocking and the tight end is going to stay in and block. And they're going to have a three-man route. And there's going to have two routes on the outside that are just pretty much just vertical routes. That could be two like straight vertical nine routes. Or they could be hitches or comebacks or anything like that. And then the middle guy, the third third receiver, he has what a lot of people would call the middle read. So if it's cover two, cover four, and the middle of the field is open, he is going to find that space between the two safeties. If it's a one safety defense and there's a safety in the middle of the field, he is going to break at a 90 degree angle and run like a dig right run like a a 12 in and this is just something that teams are getting into a lot because they want to protect and they just want to give their one player the chance to find an opening and have the quarterback just throw it to them now obviously with lsu you could have done a lot more stuff because burrow was so good at reading coverage and all that stuff but still they went back to this play time and time again you saw it against alabama you saw it against clemson what they were able to do is just simplify it so much that um, Burrow always knew where he was going with the ball. He never felt um, compromised. You know, the protection never felt compromised because you were protecting with seven. And if you ever felt like, hey, the um, you know, if there was a one high safety and he was stuck to the middle of the field, or against Clemson, they played too high, but the safeties were low, you can take a shot on the outside. So Jamar Chase touchdown against Clemson, uh, I believe, is on this play. Um there's a Jamar Chase touchdown against Alabama on this play. A lot of Jamar Chase touchdowns on this play. But also you have a lot of catches by Jefferson in the middle playing the slot. So that's kind of what I wanted to get into. R Tong, Land Dancer. So R for right, I guess it could be L Tong too. Tong is the formation. Uh, land, I, I believe, is the protection, the play action protection. And Dancer is their three verticals with a middle field read uh, concept. So I mean that I mean that basically breaks it down. I don't know how much more simple it can, it can get. Goes outside an over route, bender route, dig route inside based on what the uh, defense is giving you. So yeah, it's just three word. They're like literally as simple a play as there is in offensive football. Uh, and like when when you think about this play, when you think about um, where college football is going, do you see this as the as one of the big plays? Even just started next year, 2021 season, like, is this something that you're going to see every team kind of get into? I, in, in whatever way, in whatever specific way that offensive coordinator wants to get into it, um, but as a, as a broad concept. 
Yeah, I mean, this would if there was one play outside of like inside zone or split zone that every offense is going to have, like this would be it. And like you said, some teams get to it off of play action. Some teams just go straight drop back with it. Some teams will do it from empty and yeah. put two wings on either side and chip. Like you see that a lot in the NFL. Um, yeah, like that is, I mean, that is like the play in, in football right now. And LSU's big thing was not only did they run that, they would run that with tempo. So, you know, you're talking about three NFL receivers between Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, and Terrace Marshall. You have an NFL tight end in Thad Moss. You have an NFL running back in Clyde Edwards yeah, and and an NFL quarterback <laughs> in Joe Burrow. So, you know, when you add in the talent plus the tempo, you know, and the fact that they had the offensive line to stay in five-man protections, and now when you're letting these guys who are tight ends and running backs chip and get that, even more time, too, yeah. like, you know, that – it. You saw, I mean, you saw what Alabama was doing, what Clemson was doing. A lot of those plays, it's like, it was great coverage for three and a half seconds, but I don't have a coverage to last six and a half seconds with, you know? Yeah, like Terrence Marshall, that I think I think he scored against Auburn on this same mm-hmm. concept. So, like, they ran this up and down the field, especially against Alabama. They were they really yeah, set they the table Alabama to that game that. in 2019 with this concept. So, yeah, it's something that, um, as I said, I think, you know, LSU did do a lot of stuff that was, I, I would say, more difficult on the quarterback because they had the quarterback that could do it. But this specifically made Burrow's life a lot easier. Just read wherever Jefferson goes. And if you want it, throw a fit. Very exactly. Simple. Just e- easy to manufacture explosive plays. All right. So that is uh, the PFF uh, Offensive Concept of the Week. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll be back with our interview with uh, Coach Mike Tice. We now welcome to the PFF College Football Podcast, Coach Mike Tice. Uh, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be with you guys, spend a little time today. Um, so the first thing, I got to get this out of the way. Uh, the first thing is me and Deontay are both uh, friends with your son, Nate. So as we do this, as we do this uh, podcast, any embarrassing story that you remember Maybe he peed the bed when he was a kid. Maybe something like that. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome to say it as we go on here. Hey, he's already warned me. He said you guys were his friends, and he said do not play around. And I was like, <laughs> I'm on my best behavior today. I do not need him getting mad at me. <laughs> so, uh, Coach, um, I think people people certainly know you. Uh, former head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. Um, offensive line coach uh, for and a bunch of different places. But what I think a lot of people don't know about you is, and you played, I believe you played tight end in the NFL, but yeah. a, what a lot of people don't know about you is you played quarterback at the University of Maryland. Uh, so how, like, that is something that I don't think we're ever going to, we don't see a lot of anymore, and I don't think we're going to see it a lot anymore, is guys going, transitioning from quarterback in college to tight end in the NFL. Um, what can you t- explain this whole story? Like, it's so wild to me that a guy could go from quarterback to, to NFL tight end. Well, um, I was a solid athlete coming out of high school, pretty, pretty doggone good basketball player as well. My high school coach, I know I mentioned to you guys off air, was George O'Leary, coach George O'Leary of Central Florida fame. Uh, he was my high school coach, and he uh, pushed me towards the University of Maryland because they wanted to uh, keep me a quarterback. And uh, in high school, I, we ran the option. We threw a lot of three-step. We had some great athletes on the outside. Uh, I felt like I had a strong enough arm to play college quarterback. I guess Coach O'Leary did too because I'll tell you a quick funny story. Uh, we were working out in the weight room and the phone rang and it was coach uh, Paterno from Penn state. And he got me on the phone and he wanted me to come in for a visit as a tight end. And of course I was, I was a quarterback. I was a tight end. I'm not going to Penn state, but I just think that maybe if I moved to tight end a little bit sooner at Maryland, maybe I would have made some money as a player in the <laughs> NFL. <laughs> I got yeah. drafted, but you know, I went to mini camp and, uh, I had I had gotten hurt pretty severely going into my junior year. The last play I was supposed to play in the spring game, I landed on my shoulder and had a third degree separation and had to have a screw put in my right throwing arm. 
So that arm that I thought I had where, you know, I could stand <laughs> flat footed and throw at 65 was gone. Right. And so really at Maryland, I handed off a hell of a lot to Charlie Wysocki and uh, actually did some blocking at the, at quarterback. Uh, did not get drafted, did not really have a lot of phone calls coming out of college at the University of Maryland. Uh, but the Seattle Seahawks, a new team, uh, called me, John Thompson, the general manager, and uh, offered me a free agent contract and said I could come in as a quarterback. Well, that lasted till eh, three or four throws into minicamp when a guy named Paul Johns from Tulsa uh, ran a go route and I underthrew him by 15 yards. And I figured, boy, oh boy, I better move to tight end like my brother John plays or uh, go back to my high school and become the high school football coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I worked out. I worked out the entire summer with my brother John and my high school coaches and a couple guys on Long Island that had been cut in the NFL. And I worked out as a tight end. And I went to camp as a quarterback. Again, that lasted about – two or three days and uh, coach uh, uh, coach uh, Jack Patera called me into his office and said, I had two choices. I could go home or I could move to tight end. And so I had just gotten off the phone with my dad and said, dad, I'll be home Friday. He goes, you got, you've only been there three days. You already have a day off. I said, no, dad, they moved me to tight end and I'm number 91 and Friday's the first cut. I'll be home because of course, we all know 91's an incredible <laughs> number. And so, so that was my transition to tight end in the NFL and my college uh, playing days. We had, you know, moderate teams. I think we went eight and three and seven and four, played in a couple bowl games and uh, really didn't have any stats to talk about. Uh, but I enjoyed playing quarterback. It was great to be able to lead men. And, uh, and learn all the positions because as a quarterback, of course, you have to learn all the positions. And as a tight end, it took a couple of years to transition over to uh, become a player that could get on the field. That's cool. Um, it's actually, it's funny that this continues to come up. We were just talking to Quincy Avery, uh, who trains quarterbacks on the last podcast. And I actually just had this conversation with the quarterback. Um, so I was going to ask you, I guess you kind of touched on it, what that conversation was like when a coach had to sit you down and break your heart and let you know that you can't play your dream position anymore. Like I just did that two nights ago with the quarterback. So, well, I fashioned myself and hopefully still do, but you know, after so many years of getting hit in the head, I fashioned myself as a, a, a decently intelligent human being. And when I saw uh, my arm was not there and I saw that I couldn't make the throws in that first mini camp, I figured it out pretty quick. If I wanted to stay in football, I better do something different besides want to play quarterback. So, yes, you know, sir. back then there was another player uh, at a university of Kentucky in the early eighties. I believe it was Derek Ramsey. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, who played quarterback in Kentucky. And he also had a nice uh, NFL career as a tight end. I believe that's what his name was. But uh, like I said, I'm getting a little older. I'm a little, I'm a little forgetful. No, you're uh, correct. I was looking at it now. Yeah, so Derek Ramsey went to the University of Kentucky and played a uh, tight end in the league. Yeah, and had a nice career. I think he did some time with the Raiders, and uh, mm -hmm. he, he, did a, he did a nice job as well. I mean, just, it just hit me like Logan Thomas, who's playing right now as a tight end in, in the NFL, uh, played quarterback at Virginia Tech. So that's, mm -hmm. but again, we just, it's just not something we see. Yeah, it's just so, not, doesn't happen like that anymore. Um, well, the athlete, the athletes have changed, you know, now uh, the athletes are uh, just like in high school. I mean, most high school coaches that are successful try to take their best athlete and put them at quarterback. And in college, it seems to be about the same. Now you look around college football and many of the best athletes, if not the best top three, four, five athletes on the football team are at the quarterback position. Yeah. When you, so when you tr um, uh, moved over to tight end, uh, obviously there was some, you had some sort of a, a enough like athletic talent to, to, for someone to say, Hey, we can move you and, and for you to obviously have a career, but like how quickly did you have to learn the technique, you know, hand usage and, and even your, your feet, you know, the whole from top to bottom, how quick was that transition? Like, you know, like clearly you made the team, so you, you, it worked, but it must've been a difficult transition. You know, the hardest part was what I ended up being for 14 years was a grunt, a blocking tight end. <laughs> 
And uh, it was really hard to learn how to roll your hips and block, especially since I, I had never done it before. But I remember uh, after the first strike in 82, they released Coach Patera and Mike McCormick, who was the general manager, the great offensive lineman from the Cleveland Browns and great general manager. Of course, he started the Carolina Panthers, uh, had a great illustrious career in the NFL. He took me outside and taught me how to roll my hips on a sled. And from that moment on, I was a big one-man sled guy. I, I worked every Friday on the one-man sled to learn how to roll my hips and keep my pad level down. I'm six foot eight. So, you know, it's really hard to have that leverage where you can get underneath the pads of the defenders. And so that's what it took me was Mike McCormick to take me outside and teach me how to roll my hips on a one-man sled. And that took a while. But when Chuck Knox came in as a head coach, the great offensive line coach, the great head coach, and the great man, uh, God, God bless him, uh, he really took me to a different level using my hands. And that's when the rules changed over to where you were able to use your hands and you didn't have to use your forearms to block. And with these long arms, Inspector Gadget was a nickname I had at one point. Uh, with these long arms, it was real easy for me to get inside and hold a guy. Like Jack Del Rio said, I, I was a really bad holder. I mean, I was a good holder, but I was a pain in the neck because all I did was held, held, sure. held, the, held the defenders. <laughs> Man, as a defensive coach, I think I need to start beating the door to go back to those days where we can only block with our forearms. We're going on a crusade to get all of these rules changed back. We're going to eliminate the right? pass at some point, too. No kidding. no kidding, man. The rule changes helped us guys with the long arms. I can tell you that much. Absolutely. So, um, you know, kind of sticking to the earlier parts of your, your time in football, at least like through college, um, while you were playing quarterback, um, what was – passing offense like you know nowadays everything is so open everybody is playing like with tight ends who can split out and become x receivers or play in the slot the slot type has changed over time even your typical x and z receivers now we don't we don't think about in the same way we did even when i was a kid let alone you know in the 80s to early 90s so you know as you were kind of coming up um with your life in football how can you kind of explain the changes in passing offense up to this point well, you know, I played for the, another great guy, another great coach and very, very disciplined coach and Jerry Claiborne. And uh, we ran the ball a lot. We were going to run the ball, whether I hurt my shoulder or not. And we ran the ball a lot. And a lot of what we did was play action off the run, move the pocket, give the quarterback the ability to continue to run if the throw wasn't there. And a lot of half field reads, a lot of half field reads, not a whole heck of a lot of drop back little bit of a quick game, but it wasn't the most exciting offense to be in. And that's why when I went to the NFL and played for, you know, ground Chuck for all those years, I was used to that. Right. Right. Uh, you talk about something that's been on my mind for, for a few years now. You talk about a little bit of quick game. Um, we, there was in a sense, like, you know, after you would have graduated or you would have left Maryland, a little bit of a quick game, um, it was a quick game era. I don't know what to call it, you know, with, you know, from the 49ers and stuff like that, and then ch ch trickling down. And now we're kind of at the end of the quick game era. Every quick game is being, it's, it's going the way of the Dodo bird. It's done. Like people just want right. to run RPOs now RPOs, all the time. Yeah. And instead yeah. of, instead of, um, you know, having their quarterback take a drop back, read a defender, make an accurate throw. It's just like, Hey, we're going to put the ball down. You have one decision to make really. So, so like, where do you see, do you see like this as a trend going forward, especially in the NFL? We know it's a trend in college, but especially in the NFL, do you think quick game is just, it's just a dying breed. Is it, is it over? Is quick game done? Like, well, I, I don't think the quick game uh, in the big realm is over because it's a quick game now of balls to the wide receivers on or behind the line of scrimmage giving them a chance to get that ball in their hands quickly and make the defense tackle. And that's the quick game that you see nowadays is get the ball in the hands of the athletes and give them the opportunity to make plays with their athleticism and their great explosiveness and quickness. The thing that has changed is offensive line play. 
the balls get out so quick nowadays. There are a couple of teams out there that hold the ball and still do some seven step. But for the most part, you watch the television, you listen to all those next gen stats and they talk about, you know, well, look at Roethlisberger this year. He wasn't holding the ball more than a one point something seconds. And, you know, the offensive line play and technique to me is what has uh, gone. And I'm obviously talking about the NFL is what has gone down t- for me as an offensive line guy in the national football league. And also in talking to some college coaches over the past number of years, I think the technique in college has gone down because they don't, with all the rules, get enough time to spend always on technique that they want to work on because they have to decide, am I going to make sure the players know their assignments and, uh, and make sure that we can get our team work in, or am I going to spend X amount of time on technique? So I think that's a change also that I'm seeing when I watch not only uh, NFL football, but college football. So like, you know, you talk, is this something that started, um, especially in the NFL with the new CBA? I mean, a lot of people talk about this, a lot less practice time to get offensive linemen, especially people talk about this all the time with especially offensive linemen, just trying to get them ready because there's a lot less practice time. So like what, when you, when that happened, and you were obviously still in the league at, during that transition. What was the things that you have to change? What were the things that, that offensive linemen in general had to change um, to be ready to play on Sundays now? You know, guys, it's, it's a great question. Uh, what I found towards the end of my coaching career was you had to find a way to uh, spend enough time to get those combination blocks in because the offensive line – if you look at it, it's always, except for the backside guy, there's always two guys or three, if you weren't in that zone, working in tandem and with the same footwork and the same pad placement. And when you don't have the ability to do that in pads and do those nine on sevens and do those uh, mixed team drills where you're going against linebackers and those type things, it makes it difficult for offensive line coaches to prepare their guys to get ready when the, when the, when the gun goes off and the whistle blows. So, I mean, now, you know, when I watch the NFL, I think that, and not that this has not been this way, there have always been coaching trees, but it's always, it's really fascinating to me to kind of watch guys off of particular coaching trees and how they kind of teach up the run game. So you have like all of your Shanahan guys who are like very much 21 and 12 personnel, like Mike used to run, um, we're running wide zone or running our bootlegs off of that. You know, maybe we have one or two changeups based on the way the teams defend outside zone. And then you see like some teams who have maybe adopted a little bit more of the spread stuff. who are running like your Y off split zone. Um, so if I had to ask you, like, when you think about where the game is now from a run game perspective, as we continue to transition in more of a spread era, how much of a space do you think there will be in the NFL specifically for guys beyond like the Shanahan tree to still run like your two back wide zone, your lead zones um, and things like that? Well, you're seeing a lot more teams run that zone scheme and then run the play actions off of those and try to get those receivers behind those linebackers when they step up to stop the run game. But what I see in my evaluation of the talent that it takes to run those schemes, you're seeing, especially on the inside guys, you're seeing, you're seeing the smaller athletic players that can move along the line of scrimmage. That's fine. I'll use the Minnesota Vikings as an example. Had some nice offensive numbers, you know, under Coach Kubiak last year. And uh, what the problem I see is when it gets into a game where you're behind and you have to throw, that right. type athlete, that type athlete cannot hold up in one-on-one pass protection. And so when they have to throw the ball to win the game because the other team does take away your run game, or you get behind, those teams don't seem to hold up as well, for me anyway, watching it as a fan, they don't seem to hold up as well in a drop back game when you have to drop back and throw the football. So you talk about 
um, you know, smaller players inside and stuff like that. Um, in, in my, I guess, football watching lifetime, let's say from like 2000 on, uh, it feels like we went defensive fronts kind of have ebbed from maybe like a, your classic three, four. Then I think it went to more of a four down look. And now we're maybe going back to a, to an odd front type of look, but a very different odd front type of look where you have in that, in that bare tight front type of uh, situation. So I was curious about the interaction between, you know, any offensive line with a center guard tackle and linebackers, because, you know, there was a time when if you were playing against the three, four, maybe the two guards were uncovered and they're just working to the linebacker. And that's a, that is a particular interaction that you get. Now it's a very different because now the guards are usually covered, you know, in this tight front, like the Rams run, like every team in college runs, you know, all of a sudden the guards are covered. So how is like the interaction between, I guess, not just linebackers and, and offensive linemen, but offensive line and just defensive front players changed over, over your, your career or your, t- your time watching football? Well, my whole thing was always, I don't know if it's because I'm six, eight, whatever, whatever. I'm not going to tell you what I <laughs> weigh, but it's not under, it's not under 300 anymore. I can tell you that. But you know, when you want to stop the run, you go buddy Ryan and, and you cover up the inside guys. Now yeah. that also is a problem when you, you have smaller offensive players inside centers or guards, typically your center is not a real big guy anyway. Um, but, but that tends to be a little bit of an issue. But on the other side of it, if you don't have athletic guys inside, they can't get to the second level in the run game and get to those linebackers. So I think it's an interesting mix of the type of athlete that's now out there and the type of ways that the defenses are trying to stop these teams from running that zone on them up and down the football field. That makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of sticking with like defensive fronts and structure of defense from an offensive line perspective. I kind of wanted to look at the passing game. Um, your son, Nate, is actually, he has taught me more about protection, I think, in the last 10 months yeah. than I had ever known before. Um, not that I felt like I was any kind of aficionado, but, you know, I felt like, hey, I mean, I know there's slides and there's mans. <laughs> <And> that, <laughs> you know, and I felt like I really knew something. And, you know, he has kind of illuminated the way that protection works, especially when we start talking about higher levels of football. Um, so I guess kind of stealing from Seth's question, as these fronts change, how have, how have you seen protections change in kind? Well, I don't know if it's as the fronts have changed, but as the coaching has changed and the schemes that are coming into the league and the schemes that are emphasized in the league, Mm-hmm. You're seeing, I say, I call it three types of protections. You have a slide protection where the line is working to a weak side linebacker, but you're still man to man on the front side. You have man protection, like the old scat protection, where the right. back is heavily involved in pickup and, and you get a lot of guys with no help. And then you get what a lot of the league is doing, uh, which is, uh, to me, a little bit hurtful is they're doing a lot of turn protection. And all they're doing is turning the line to one direction or the other and fitting on the end of the line scrimmage with either a tight end, a fullback, or a back. In my opinion, teams are doing that because it's easy uh, to teach. Yeah. It's easy to teach. There's not a lot of assignments. Where you come into problems or teams that blitz against that, there's usually a short edge or there's a matchup issue between that smaller athlete, that back, that fullback, that tight end against a bigger defender that can come off the end of the line scrimmage and, uh, and hurt that turn protection. Absolutely. I know as a defensive coach, when I see full, anytime I see full slide, it's too off an edge. You know, trying to get a defensive end on some poor 5'10", 185 pound high school running back. You might be, you might be my end once, but if I get, if I get 10 shots at it, I know I'll have a good day. Well, that's why I always taught when I was coaching and I don't coach anymore, but I always taught if we're going to do turn protection, don't turn, don't turn towards air. Right. You know, if our number count looks like we can have, good matchups in our favor. I, I watch NFL games and I get PO'd. I get really annoyed sometimes because I see a team 
So you see how my, I'm getting a little riled up here. <laughs> I see a team turn the line, turn the line of scrimmage one way or another with five offensive linemen to three defenders. Right. And meanwhile, the other side's overloaded. Like you said, two on a back, two on a tight end, or even sometimes three. Makes no sense to me. So we would always adjust that turn protection if we had good numbers. And that's why I said turn protection, slide protection, man protection are three different things. I think you guys, when you're saying slide, you're referring to what I term turn protection. Mm -hmm. I think there's three yeah. different things. And we always made a, made a point if the numbers were good in our favor, let's turn that slide, uh, turn protection into a slide, a slide protection. Mm -hmm. Now we have good numbers. Right. You, you know what? I, watching LSU in the olden days, and when I mean by olden days, I mean basically any time before 2019, which seems, <laughs> seems like a long time ago now. Uh -huh. But, you know, th that was their protection, right? They would, you know, again, what, what me and Deontay might call like a full slide and then put the back and the tight end on full the backside. Slide, right. yeah. And what would happen was teams knew they were doing it. And now all of a sudden they'll, they'll play games with you because now you're sliding one way. You think the numbers are there. But now the defensive end's dropping out. Maybe the linebacker was mugged out. He's dropping out. They're still only sending four, but they're getting pressure because they've created a good matchup, like you're saying, two on two on the on the weak side, two on one on the weak side, three on two, whatever it is. And that was talking about getting frustrated. Watching LSU pass protection for for two decades was very frustrating Absolutely. for me. But it, well, it worked out in the you end. Know, you guys are calling it full slide. And like I said, when you say full slide, I'm, I'm saying turn. When, yeah. mm -hmm. when you say slide, you're sliding your line to one linebacker or a defensive back right. or another, if it's nickel or dime. When it's turn, you're just turning your line to a zone. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like inside, outside zone in pass protection. Right. Again, it's easy to teach. So that's why a lot of guys do it. What's not easy to teach is when you have that turn protection and you get those good numbers like you guys are talking about, which are bad numbers off the edge, but right. good numbers with the turn. So it's nice and firm. Yeah. But if you want to hang on to the ball, you're not going to have that kind of time when you're running that turn protection and they blitz off the edge. Or like you said, you know, two over there on the one back or two on three on the two, you know, the back and the tight end, you have numbers issues. So again, I go back to, I would always convert that. I would have my center convert that and the line convert that turn protection or, full slide protection into a slide protection. How important is the... But you, you got to teach it. You got to be able to sir. teach it. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's... But so, so like, how important is now the um, communication between... You talk about, you know, having your center do things, um, change the calls, do all that stuff. How important is the communication? We see it all the time, the communication between the quarterback and the center or whoever is like maybe the leader of that offensive line group. I don't know if it necessarily has to be the center, but um, in, in getting into that right protection, something we talked about last week on the podcast with Quincy Avery was that, you know, one of the problems with quarterbacks who want to come into the league who aren't super athletic, that's a, they need to be able to get into the right protections all the time because they get to be able to save their own ass. And maybe they, and that's kind of a problem where we have the quarterback development in, in, at the highest level is you don't give them enough time to learn that stuff. So if they can't escape by themselves, if they're not Lamar Jackson, if they're not Deshaun Watson being able to escape like that or Patrick Mahomes, um, you know, they're going to be wrong. Sometimes they're going to allow pressure because they didn't, they didn't check to the right thing. So yeah, just, just overall, like what is that communication like? How important is it between the center and the quarterback or even between the center and his, and his buddies on the offensive line? It's, it's extremely important. It's, it's because you have X amount of blockers and uh, at some point you're not going to have enough blockers for teams that send seven, you know, or eventually sometimes all out cover zero. So it's very important that the offensive line, whether it's the center making the call or the quarterback making the call uh, or, and, and I'll tell you nothing, some teams call who the line is working to and some teams call who the running back is working to and basically let the running back, you know, you got him, whether which way you do it, it doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, the blockers and the quarterback all need to know who's the free guy, because if you don't know who the free guy is, then you get those sacks where you're looking at the television or looking at the tape and saying, how the hell did that guy come free like that? And a lot of times it's because, there's a lack of awareness 
of who is the free guy in the scheme. Makes sense. Um, so I, we're going to stay on protections for, for one more, at least for me, um, you know, as, as a high school coach, now that I've learned a little bit about protection, like now I kind of get a kick out of whether I'm talking to our office coordinator at the school I'm working at other OCs locally, people on social media, you know, and I think everybody kind of gets big eyes about these passing concepts. Like, Oh, you know, we're going to work this high, low here. There's going to be a post on the backside here. We'll have an alert here. The back will swing out, you know, and the whole time I'm thinking as a defensive coach, when they ask me how I'll stop it, I I think that now I have gone from being a coverage guy to just saying, well, I'm just going to get after the quarterback. You know, what's your answer for this pressure? What's your answer for that pressure? So I'm interested, you know, from your perspective, having worked in the league, you know, do you have any kind of stories and memories from maybe guys wanting to do certain things offensively and you kind of had to tell them, oh, hold your horses a bit. <laughs> Let's talk about, you know, what's happening up front first or, you know, maybe a working in the other way where as an offensive line coach or somebody who understands offensive line, maybe you feel a certain way about the way protection should go. And the OC wants to call this, this, and that on the pass. And um, how do you kind of game plan that out and communicate? So that way everybody's on an accord with what is and what's not possible in the passing game. Well, once you put your schemes in and your routes match up with your protections and your formations and the center of the quarterback identifies where the blockers are working to, again, I go back to, There might be some schemes that don't have a built-in hot or have a quick route Mm -hmm. as an answer to that free runner, if you will. But then there are many. Mike Martz was the master of it, and that's how he won the Super Bowl, is he wanted that free runner to come because he had an answer almost every time. I was fortunate enough to work with Mike with the Bears. He had an answer almost every time, as long as the quarterback knew where that was, of a quick throw or a hot that got the ball in the athlete's hand, you know, one step slant, Mike, Mike March was the king of the one steps, you know, the one step or the no step slant and getting that ball out of the quarterback's hand. When those defenders were coming free on the blitz, when you get good as an offensive line and as, and I've been blessed to be on a couple really good offensive teams under Denny green. And also as the head coach of the Vikings is you're begging them to come. They're like, let's go. We got answers for whatever you want to do. The other thing that's important is I've been blessed to coach three Pro Bowl centers, Jeff Christie, Matt Burke. I coached Olin Krutz, but I didn't put him in the Pro Bowl. He was already in a Pro Bowl, but then Rodney Hudson with the Raiders. So I was able to get three centers. It's important, at least it was for me, that the centers understand protections as good as the quarterback does. And where it all starts is where are those safeties? Which way are they rotating to? What hash are they hovering on? What side is the backside uh, safety hovering? Where is he at? What's his depth? Is the slot capped? How deep is the cap? All of these things are going to tell you where the pressure is going to come from. And then, and then you could either change your protection or make sure everybody knows. That's when you see the quarterback point. Make sure everybody knows who's getting that ball because – He's going to be the guy that's going to get it when they bring that extra defender. But how, how hard is it to get to that point where you're understanding? I mean, even for quarterbacks who, who look at safeties all the time, just getting to that point where they understand safety rotations and you said like capping the slot and all that stuff like that doesn't seem like it's that, um, you know, we don't do that a lot in college, I think. Um, so then they're coming to the NFL a little bit raw. Like how long does that take to, to get them to that level? Oh, man, you kidding me? But, you know, but I tell you, going back to how we started this thing, it's me playing quarterback at the University of Maryland and understanding the protections and understanding the coverages that gave me the ability, and I had smart guys playing center for me, gave me the ability to teach them the coverages so they understood as well as the quarterback did what those answers were when they had those rotations, but it takes time. It takes day one and you got to emphasize it and you got to teach it and you got to spend time with it. Again, we go back to, from what I've understood, never coached in college. My, my brother-in-law is a defensive line coach at Rutgers. He's been in college almost his whole career. And, and the thing is they don't get that time sometimes to spend it on those intricacies that you need to do to take your, your stuff 
to the next level and be, you know, exceptional. Right. And you mentioned, uh, you mentioned some of the offensive linemen that you were, or the centers at least that you've worked with, um, Matt Burke, which immediately, you know, brings back memories Harvard. of watching. Yep. Harvard guy, you know, obviously, you know, very well prepared for his NFL career, had a very long and illustrious career. Um, so when you look back over your career as a coach, um, if you were saying, if you had like a handful of maybe college guys preparing for the pros and they were asking you, who should I be modeling myself after, whether it's, you know, mentally, uh, physically, technique perspective, whatever the case may be, who are guys that you've worked with that you would refer them to? Well, Matt Burke played left tackle at Harvard and I moved him to center and, you know, the rest was, you know, history, a couple of pro bowls, a couple of injuries then finished his career with the Ravens. Mm -hmm. Jeff Christie uh, was one of the first players in a league to pull at center. I know some other coaches out there took credit for that, but you can go back and check tape. Of when I was coaching Jeff Christie, there was only one other guy in the league pulling at center. And that was Damani Dawson. Uh, mm -hmm. for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jeff Christie played fullback in college and had a whole lot of touchdowns and played guard at Pitt when I got him, and we moved him to center full-time. So, you know, I'm very lucky to have two guys like that, both athletic, both intelligent, and then Rodney Hudson, you know, might be the best of the three of them because he was, you know, thick and strong, intelligent, student of the game, very poised, and a great leader. So, I mean, Olin Krutz, unfortunately, I got him at the end. But Olin Krutz, when I worked him out at the University of Washington, I fell in love with him. I wanted him. We didn't get a chance to draft him. But like I said, late in my career, when I went to the Bears, he, he I think we got one and a half years out of him and his elbow went. But another guy that for me as a center, student of the game, brilliant, smart, tough as nails, and very athletic in his prime. So there's, I mean, I was lucky to coach those type guys. It's a, it's a pretty good list, I tell you that. Yeah. Um, is there anyone, have you watched any of the guys that are coming out to the draft this year, whether it's Sewell or Slater and stuff like that? When no, you, when I, haven't you... really, okay. yeah, I haven't really looked at any college tape for the draft yet. You know, I watched a couple of workouts on TV this w last weekend or yeah. whatever they were showing because the combine's virtual or whatever it is. But no, I haven't really studied it Uh you know, I haven't uh, really put a lot of time into looking at the tape for a, for a novice like me, you know, I don't have, I don't know if I'm making an excuse. What well, I don't have the access to the film, the college film, you know, I have access to the NFL film like everybody else through direct right. TV and the play pass or whatever it's called. But uh, the college film, I don't want to work that hard. You know, I'm retired. I hear that. <laughs> you and me both, man. You want to pay me, you want to pay me to evaluate some college linemen? Hey, I'll do it. Just send me a check. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you, so you, you talk about you and you watch um, you'll go and watch games on Game Pass even though you're it, it, you're retired. What what are the things you, you're looking for? Like, are you do, do you still find yourself going through like the same kind of checklist that you were going through when you're coaching and breaking down film? Uh, now you're just you know in a sense watching it for fun. Do you still do you still find yourself looking for the same stuff? Well, I find myself watching the coaches copy, but mostly the end zone. And, uh, you know, I think that's the old line in me reverting back to looking at the end zone. But mm -hmm. I, I'm like anyone. I like to look at the run schemes that they're doing. You know, I like to look at the angles they're trying to create in a run game. I like to look at anything new that they're doing just for fun, just so if you're talking to somebody, you can at least act like you're paying attention to what's going on in the and the transformation of the National Football League. But the one thing I like to look at is protections, man, because I don't like to see free runners, and I don't like to see the quarterbacks getting hit and getting sacked. And there's too many quarterbacks getting hit and too many unnecessary sacks, in my opinion, in the National Football League. I wish I could agree with you, but I'm a defensive coach, so <laughs> that's all, it's always good. To, always right? Good to me. Right? Yeah, yeah. but yeah, we, we yeah. definitely do see a lot of unblocked pressure, a lot, a lot of early pressure on, on quarterbacks at the professional level. And there are times where I'm watching them like, well, you know, I'm glad the defenses are performing well, but that probably should not have happened. Um, what I did want to ask you, you know, I'll just kind of rapid fire these off and you know I, this is kind of you know off, off the cuff so if you don't have an answer it's okay but I did want to ask you based on fronts maybe what you kind of liked in the run game while you were coaching um, so first I wanted to start with like your regular typical 4-3 over front if you were in whether you're in 21 or 11 personnel um, whatever personnel package that you prefer 
what were some of the runs that you would carry into a week where a team is playing four, three, and we'll say they're playing cover one and cover three. Well, to me, you know, you had a couple of different schemes that were very versatile. I was always a guy that tried to design the run game as much as you can to attack the bubble. Cause I always mm-hmm. felt like if you continue to attack the bubble, the bubble is going to burst. Yeah. That was number one on my list. So anyone that worked with me can tell you, Tice was always trying to run at the bubble. And if you wanted to get in a checking game and a numbers count and check away from the safety, that was also uh, something that you can incorporate. But if you wanted to run into the safety and you got to remember when the safety is dropping down, normally the rest of the linebackers and or the defensive line are shifting away. Shifting. Right. So you, what we would do was we would make that, and we designed this when we pulled against John Lynch, uh, Tampa Bay, when I was with the Vikings working under Danny Green and Brian Billick. Mm-hmm. We designed it that we treated John Lynch in a two-by-two, two, 11 personnel, uh, you know, nickel. Uh, we designed it where that guy, John Lynch, counted as a Sam linebacker. So we right. would just change them all the X's and give ourselves the angles. So mm-hmm. regardless of the front, to me, it was more important to uh, make sure that you weren't running uphill, so to speak, right. and you were running into good leverage. And you gave yourself a chance because it's all about angles. That's what the run game is all about. So, you know, you talk about always running into the bubble. Now we look at, like I said, especially in college football with this tight front with a zero and two, four eyes, where's the bubble? So like, how do you think you would, you know, let's say you were coaching college or, or, I mean, this game is coming to the NFL. Uh, You know, the Rams ran it a lot last year. Other teams are starting to get into it. You know, how would that change your, you know, your look schematically when you were playing, if you played teams without a bubble? I mean, I'm sure you saw a lot of bare fronts too, again, without without a bubble. Well, if you're going to play those teams that are running that kind of front, you got to do some kind of double team and down block and you got to pull somebody. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's that's what you got to do. You got to create that seam in the defense. And so, uh, like anything else we were talking about, what's easy? I think it's a lot easier to rep and teach with no pads uh, zone scheme than it is to mm-hmm. rep and yeah. and teach some type of gap scheme, yeah. right. even if it's 11 personnel gap scheme, an 11 personnel power, so to speak, or an O play, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a uh, plant, well, there's a lot of names for it. But, you know, you get to those fronts like that, it's really good to double team and down block, back block with the center and pull somebody because now you can create that you can create that scene for the running back to get up into instead of, you know, beating your head against the wall saying, oh, my goodness, we have no double teams. We have three individual blocks on the outside. We can't run the ball. Yeah. It was one of my favorite things to do is to watch teams try to win inside zone against these tight fronts and goes for like two yards per carry. And I, and I know the offensive coordinators in the headset losing his mind. And I'm sitting here watching, like, this is never going to happen for you. You know, if you give defensive linemen or guys up front one-on-ones play after play, you know, eventually we will blow you up as defensive guys. Um, yeah. So I do think, I do think it's interesting that you bring up the gap scheme. So, cause I know on the college level, I mean, Oklahoma is probably, and Lincoln Riley is probably like the poster child for guys who playing the spread offense will run the old school counter tray against the tight front because he knows as long as we get the down blocks we need, we'll have a crease, you know, wherever we're trying to run the football. But we don't see a lot of that at the college level. Well, again, it goes into teaching time. It takes time to execute those plays and have the timing. There's a lot more timing in a in an O scheme or a gap scheme Mm -hmm. uh, than there is in the zone where you're just coming off the ball and you block the guy that's in your zone I mean it goes back to turn protection what are the easiest things to teach turn protection and zone scheme I mean I mean to me anyway okay uh last question before we get you out of here um I asked this to all the quarterbacks that we've had on the podcast uh, or I try to try to remember. And since you are a former quarterback, I can ask you this question. You are stranded on a deserted island. You can take with you one passing concept. It's a theoretical thing here. You can take one pass, could be four verts, it could be uh, curl flat, it could be, and you could be as specific as you want in terms of personnel formation or just as broad as saying, you know, a concept. What is the concept that you know 
um, whether it was from your playing days or your coaching days, you just like, this is the one I need to have is a day one for me. Well, you know, I, I love that big post over the top and, you know, anytime you can get that tight end, if you're playing a cover three team, you can get that tight end to move that safety a little bit and throw that post on the backside, whether it's a five stepper or a, a deeper one with a deeper angle. And you get that, that, that you give that receiver a chance to go chase down that post. Uh, I, I like that concept. I mean, I think that's a good concept against single high. Um, of course, you know, team that's playing a lot of man, you got to have athletes that can, can win against man. And, you know, nowadays you got so many big athletes playing wide receiver. You got to, sometimes you just got to throw it and let those guys go get those contested balls and make a play and be, be the studs that they are. So okay. I'm sorry, that's probably two schemes, but that's just, uh, <laughs> that's just me, but. Coach, this was, has been a pleasure. Um, where can the people, uh, where can the people find you? Right. It, it is. It's St. Patrick's hey, day. So, it's St. Patrick's yeah. day. It's St. <laughs> Patrick's day. And my wife brought me this hat back from Maryland. So I wanted to wish you and everybody happy St. Patrick's Day. Be safe out there if you don't drink and drive. But Absolutely. have a great St. Patrick's Day. And, uh, you know, I mess around with a podcast called Odds and Ends with Mike Tice. It's on YouTube. I'm taking a little hiatus right now because I'm working on a special project of ranking some of the top offensive lines in the National Football League. So i um, not doing a weekly show, but I've been working on this project for a little bit and hopefully I can get it all wrapped up and done before the draft. <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you coach for being on. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you, you guys. Man. Appreciate you, man. That was our interview with uh, coach Mike Tice, former Minnesota Vikings head coach, former Maryland quarterback. Hope you guys enjoyed it. See you next week.